The pressure will build on Israel to either share Jerusalem or place it under international control. Israel will refuse. International condemnation will come against Israel because of her actions concerning Jerusalem. Finally, a resolution will be passed on the UN Security Council demanding that Israel comply to the directives of the international community. Israel will refuse. This week on Connecting the Gap, we're going to continue our study on prophecies of the Bible as we get on into the middle of Luke. We're going to get into that right after this. Hey everyone, welcome again to Connecting the Gap. This is a brand new episode of my podcast. Thank you for joining me this week, and I hope you guys had a great Mother's Day. That was last Sunday. Hope all you moms had a wonderful day, a time of fellowship with your children, with your family, hopefully. I know it always doesn't happen that way, but hopefully all of you mothers out there listening did get the opportunity to be able to visit with your family and that kind of thing so hard to believe we're already getting into may hard to believe that we're at another mother's day but we are and uh, actually we've already passed the mother's day so it's this year's just flying right on by as i get started this week want to remind you go to my website connectingthegap.net and uh, check out my podcast platforms there. You can also get my Rumble channel link and my YouTube link as well. And I wanted to announce this week, we are on Edify. You can go to edify.app, that's E-D-I-F-I dot app. And if you download that app onto your phone, it's all Christian podcasts. That's all that's in there. There's nothing in there except for Christian-based material. And we are now on that platform. So if you would like to check that out, or if you already listen to Edify as a regular podcast source, then you can actually subscribe to our channel there as well. And you'll get our podcast each and every week delivered right to your app right there at Edify. Dot app. So we're excited about that, a new platform that we can be on. And this one is actually kind of cool because it's all Christian stuff. <laughs> Almost everything else that we're on, of course, is pretty much a mixture of you know what. And so have to kind of get through all the noise to find us on the rest of them. But it's awesome that there's an app out there that dedicates itself to the Word of God. And we're excited to be a part of that. So go check that out today. That's edify.app. You can download the app Edify and sign up for a username and password there if you don't have one already and subscribe to us on that platform at connecting the gap well we're going to go ahead and get started this week and get into this we have reached luke chapter 17 at this point as we are cruising our way on to revelation we're going to be in verse 32 and 33 we're going to talk about she needed an attitude adjustment in that verse of scripture it says remember lot's wife Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. If you remember in Matthew, Jesus said, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. That was in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. The point is that people should develop the right attitude about God and the things of this world to put off doing so is foolish. Lot's wife is an example. God sent angels to get her out of Sodom before he destroyed that city with fire and brimstone. The angels told her to flee and not look back, but she did not listen. She disobeyed and lost her life when she was turned into a pillar of salt. Apparently she loved Sodom. She did not want to leave it, did not want to give up her worldly goods, and did not believe God would destroy that loathsome place. So while fleeing, she hesitated, looked back, and perished. She ended up losing everything anyway. This goes to the heart of people's attitudes toward worldly things. We should always be ready to give up our possessions for the things of God. Those who seek to save their life or refuse to turn it over to Jesus will lose it. And those who are willing to lose their life or give it up for Jesus will save it. 
Henry M. Morris and Henry M. Morris III was quoted, Christ accepted the historicity of Adam and Eve in Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 5, of Abel in Matthew 29, verse 35, of Noah in Luke 17, 26, of Abraham in John 8, 56 through 58, and Lot in Luke 17, verse 28. He believed in the supernatural destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, which was in Luke 17, 29, and the calamity of Lot's wife. Can you give up your vehicles, your house, and all your other possessions for Jesus? Well, during the tribulation period, those who want to keep everything will lose, and those who are willing to lose everything will gain. The decision should not be tough, and a person should not hesitate, but many will. What will you do? We all know that we can die on a moment's notice, but most people think they have plenty of time to prepare for that. It will not be that way during the tribulation period when approximately three-fourths of the world's population will die, and most of the others will be caught by the surprising return of Jesus. There are many important doctrines in the Bible, and it is difficult to say one is more important than the other because all are given by God. But the second coming appears to be one of the most important because it is mentioned so often and because it is tied to other teachings. For example, the return of Jesus will prevent mankind from destroying itself. Satan will be bound and chained when Jesus returns, many Jews will be saved, and many people will be raised from the dead. Here are some facts facts on the glorious appearing of Jesus. This is the second coming. In Mark chapter 8, verse 38, it talks about, If anyone is ashamed of Jesus, he will be ashamed of them at his coming. In Luke chapter 12, verses 35 through 40, Be prepared, because the second coming will catch the lost by surprise. Moving on into Luke chapter 21, verse 20 to 22, It talks about the end is going to be near. It says, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Jesus talked about wars and rumors of wars, and he said, But the end is not yet. That's in Matthew 24, verse 6. Here he speaks of a war that will signal the approach of the end. He warned the hostile armies will encircle Jerusalem, and when it happens, the people of Judea, that's the southernmost part of Israel that was occupied by the tribes of Judah and and Benjamin, or Petra, an ancient city in the mountains of Jordan, should immediately flee to the mountains that the people in Jerusalem should evacuate the city and that those in the surrounding area should stay away from there. Terrible events will follow and most of the area will be made desolate. The tribulation period serves several purposes. First, to punish the people of the earth for their sins, for the blood shed upon the earth, with war, murder, abortion, and all those kinds of things. Secondly, is to restore Israel their land which other nations lay claim to. Thirdly, to uphold Zion's or Jerusalem's cause, a recompense to nations for their mistreatment of Israel. Fourth, to allow Jews to bear the Lord's wrath for sinning against him. Fifth, to fulfill prophecy. And sixth, to cause Israel to turn to Jesus. The Battle of Armageddon will occur because the nations have scattered the Jews, seized the land belonging to the Jews, and divided up the land of Israel. God is returning the Jews to the land of Israel, and any nation that tries to put the Jews off the land is going against what he is doing. The Jews and the land go together. God will punish those nations that oppose what he is doing by drawing them into the battle of Armageddon. Isn't it clear what side the United States should be on? Israel will not be able to stand up against the superior forces of the Antichrist and his UN, or world army, at first. But attacking Jerusalem is a step toward the Battle of Armageddon. Just when it appears that everything is hopeless for Israel, Jesus will return. The Jews will accept him as their Messiah, and you can tell the world army a big goodbye. That's going to be the end of all of that, as the Battle of Armageddon will complete with destruction of all of those armies that came against Israel. So that's going to wrap up Luke for the New Testament, and we're going to be moving on into John at this point. We're going to start out in John chapter 5, verse 43. There's a scripture there I want to discuss here quickly, and it is about how could you do that? 
This scripture says, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. Jesus here was talking to a group of Jews, and he reminded them that as a nation they had rejected him. He was the Messiah, and he came to them in the name of God, but they wanted to get rid of him. Someday there will be someone else who will come to them as a great leader in his own name, and the Jews as a nation will eagerly accept him. This verse does not identify that person, but virtually all prophetic writers agree that he will be the Antichrist. The Jews have reestablished their Sanhedrin for many reasons, but one very important reason is the fact they believe Elijah will appear before them and announce the identity of their Messiah. Christians believe this Elijah will be their own handpicked Elijah, not the real one, and this phony will identify the wrong man. David Reagan was quoted saying, But the Bible does not teach that the Jews will receive the Antichrist as their Messiah. It teaches they will accept him as a great political leader and diplomat, and that they will put their trust in him as the guarantor of peace in the Middle East. If you remember, Jesus came in his Father's name. He called God his Father and said he could do what he saw the Father do, that the Father sent him, and that his works were testimony to that. But the Antichrist will come to honor his own name and to boast of his own works. Jesus warned that false Christ will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the very elect. The Antichrist cannot come on the scene until after the rapture, but when he arrives, the Jewish nation will love him. They will accept him as the great leader they have been looking for. Most unbelievers do not know that Christians and non-Christians will be raised from the dead and judged at different times. Christians will be raised and judged before the judgment seat of Christ, and non-Christians will be raised and judged before the great white throne of God. Here's some facts on the judgment of the unbelievers. This is concerning the great white throne. In John 3.18, we learn about the great white throne judgment that unbelievers are already under the condemnation of God. In John chapter 3, verse 36, the wrath of God abides on those who reject Jesus. In John 5.28-29, the lost will be raised from the dead and condemned forever. And in John 12, verse 48, those who reject Jesus will be judged by the words that he spoke. In John chapter 11, verse 25 to 26, the dead are going to be raised. It says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? When a man named Lazarus became seriously ill, his two sisters sent for Jesus. But he did not go immediately, and Lazarus died. Jesus finally arrived four days after Lazarus was buried. Lazarus' sister Martha was distressed. Jesus told Martha that her brother would rise again. She thought he was talking about a future resurrection. Jesus explained that she was right to believe in a future resurrection, but that was not what he was talking about. He called himself the resurrection and the life. That's John chapter 11, verse 25, which means he is the one who raises the dead, the one who gives spiritual life and physical life. He also said the living who believe in him will never die, meaning they will never die the second death, which is a spiritual death of being cast into the lake of fire. Jesus then raised Lazarus from the dead. W. Herschel Ford said he was saying that those who believed in him, even if they were dead like Lazarus, would again be brought to life. Is it possible that Jesus was also revealing the rapture, that's when the church is removed from the earth, in these verses? In essence, he said those who are dead will live again, and those who are alive will never die. When Paul revealed the rapture, he said, the dead in Christ will rise first, that's in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. In other words, the dead will live. Then Paul said, We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's verse 17 of 1 Thessalonians 4. Believers who are alive when Jesus comes for his church will go directly to heaven and not die. 
There will be two future resurrections, as quoted in John chapter 5, verse 28 to 29. There's a resurrection of life and a resurrection of damnation. This passage not only refers to the resurrection of Lazarus, but it also refers to one phase of the resurrection of life, known as the rapture. God's plans for the future include a time when Satan will be bound and Jesus will reign on the earth for a thousand years. In John chapter 14, verses 2 through 3, it says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, and where I am, there you may be also. This scripture is frequently read at funerals, and it's one of the most beloved passages in the entire Bible. Few people associate it with the rapture, but this is what exactly this scripture refers to. Jesus was going away, but he promised to return to take us back with him. He is not talking about collecting us when we die. His angels will take care of that. Rather, he is talking about returning to raise the dead in Christ and to gather those who are alive. This is what Christians call the rapture. How Lindsay was quoted, we are snatched away before we even know what hit us. We are then taken to his father's house where he has already prepared a place for us. So the rapture literally could occur at any moment. There is a difference between Jesus coming for his saints or the believers and Jesus coming with the saints. His coming for his saints is the rapture. That's 1 Thessalonians 4.17. His coming with his saints is the second coming. That's Revelation 19, verse 11 to 14. Jesus comes for his saints before the tribulation period. Jesus comes with his saints at the end of the tribulation period. When Jesus comes for his saints, or for those alive on the earth, they go up to meet him in the air. When Jesus comes with his saints, they come down with him back to the earth. Without question, the soul and spirit of a believer will go to be with God when the Christian dies. But the day will soon come when Jesus will bring that soul and spirit back so he can raise the believer from the dead with a new body. He will receive the resurrected believer unto himself and take him or her back to heaven with him. When Jesus comes for his saints, he will take them to heaven where they will remain until the tribulation period is over. While there, they will appear before the judgment seat. As we wrap up today, here's a few fast facts on the evacuation of the saints that's called the rapture. In John chapter 4, verse 36, those who win souls for Jesus will be rewarded. In John 5, 28 to 29, the saved will be raised from the dead to live forever. And in John chapter 6, verse 39, 44, and 54, Jesus will not lose any of his, and all will be raised from the dead. Aren't we all looking forward to that day when Jesus comes back and ends all of this junk that's going on in this world right now? I know I myself, I am so ready to meet my Lord in the air and get into eternity with him and get away from where we are at today in this world. But until then, we have to strive until he ke- until he comes back and we have to keep winning the lost witnessing and sharing God's word to those that have never heard or those that do not believe so that when he does come back, we'll have a huge reaping of believers as he comes back to take us all home. That's what we're all looking forward to. Well, I'm going to wrap it up this week uh, with that section of Scripture. Next uh, week, we'll be starting into Acts as we move on through the New Testament in our study on prophecies of the Bible. I'm Daniel Moore. This is my podcast, Connecting the Gap, this week's episode. Hope you guys have enjoyed that as we continue our study. And don't forget, as I said earlier, as we started off the podcast today, we're on a new platform. You can go to edify.app on the internet or go to the app stores on your phone and download the edify app and the way you spell that is e-d-i-f-i it's a complete christian platform podcast everything on there is from christian believers and bible study and that kind of thing there's no secular stuff on there at all and we are now part of that so please subscribe and download that uh, app and subscribe to us and uh, drop us a line sometime let us know how you uh, are enjoying the podcast if you're learning things have any questions on our website at connectingthegap.net there's a form you can fill out and send in to us there's also a page on how to get saved and of course all my my platforms are there and youtube and rumble links as well 
Thank you guys so much for being with me this week. And I'm going to get out of here for now. I'll be back again next week as we continue our study. Until then, God's Word never fails us. God's Word has stood the test of time. And through Jesus' death on the cross, He has connected the gap.